Good morning. Please join me in the call to worship. Rejoice, give thanks, call on God's name. The Holy One is in our midst. How good it is to come home to God's house. How good it is to gather in Christ's presence. Sing aloud, exalt with all your heart. The Sovereign One has done glorious things. We offer, we offer up our anxieties, anxieties seeking, seeking God's peace. We, we face our plenty, eager to share. Shout your praise, express your joy. The God of our salvation welcomes us. God's, God's love is renewing us in these moments. God's, God's strength is becoming, becoming our soul. Sing and 
Philippians chapter 4, page, uh, verses 4 through 9. It's on page 198 in the Pew Bible. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you. God's holy word. You will find this in chapter, I'm sorry, chapter 4 again, continuing at verse 10. Paul writes to the people of Philippi, I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need. I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Here ends this reading of God's holy word. To his name be glory and praise both now and forever. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The band had performed marvelously. They put on an excellent concert, played all of their most popular hits, and finally, when they concluded, they tipped their hat to the crowd and walked off the stage. The audience was pleased. They rose to their feet. They applauded. They shouted, they cheered, they hooted, and they hollered. And it went on and on and on. Their intentions were clear. They were requesting an encore. And finally, the artists obliged. They reappeared on the stage. The entire auditorium went into a frenzy. They gathered up their instruments, they sat down, and they played to the crowd. A magnificent encore performance. I've been preaching in one capacity or another, either as an ordained minister or as a student pastor, for almost 40 years now. I've got to tell you what, no one has ever, not one time, stood up after a worship service and applauded greatly and demanded an encore. <laughs> Generally speaking, if anything, you see somebody at the back of the room on occasion giving you one of these. Pick it up. Wrap it up. So I share these words with you today. In fact, Bobby shared them very well. Philippians 4, chapter 8. I'm sorry, verse 8. And if you remember, this is Paul's epistle to the Philippians. It's the last week we're going to be studying this. We're right to the end of the letter. And Paul has been very complimentary to the people of Philippi. He likes them. They're enjoying the message. That being said, by now, four chapters in, remember, they read this publicly during worship. There was probably somebody at church giving them one of these. <laughs> Let's wrap it up. And so, Paul says these words, Philippians 4, 8, the words every person who ever comes to worship wants to hear from the person delivering the sermon. Philippians 4, 8 begins with what word? Finally. 
when you hear the pastor say, finally, whew, <laughs> I made this suggestion in the past that when you are studying the scriptures, when you're studying the Bible, people say to me, they don't know what to look for, how to do it. I say, one of the things you want to do is you let the Holy Spirit lead you. And what you're really doing is, is let the words, listen carefully, read the words, and see which ones jump off the page at you. Which words are speaking to you at that moment? And I can assure you what the word that speaks to you at that moment is Philippians 4, 8 is finally. <laughs> well, let me tell you what, just to let you know, Paul says finally in verse 8, does anybody know how many verses there are in Philippians chapter 4? 23. When he says finally, he's got 15 more to go. Paul, however, says these words, finally, whatever is true. Remember what I just said to you a moment ago? What words jump off the page? Seriously, what word jumps off the page? Whatever is true. Ancient philosophers debated truth. Existentialist tried to wrap their head around truth. Let me ask you this. Are we still trying to discern what is true today? Paul begins by talking about truth. What did Jesus say about truth? He said, I am the truth. Paul looks and he says, whatever is true. Are we not trying to seek the truth? Are we not trying to discern the truth? Are we not trying to find it in the world that we live in now more than ever? Well, if we're not sure whether truth jumps off the page, let me tell you this. Finally, whatever is true, what does he say next? Whatever is honorable. Does that word come off the page? For what does it mean to have honor? What is tomorrow, friends? Memorial Day. What do we think of when we think of Memorial Day? Jesus said these words, greater love, no one than this. And they lay down their life for their friends. On Memorial Day, what do we think of? We think of people who made an ultimate sacrifice. For whom? For this country for what they believed in, for the values and the virtues of this country. They believed in it that much that they laid down their life for their friends. That's honor. How do we remember that? How do we repay that? Do we understand what honor is anymore? Last night, I tuned in and I saw it was the manager of a major league baseball team. Hey, Memorial Day, baseball, hot dogs, apple pie, Chevrolet, right? Major League Baseball team. You know what he said? He said, I can no longer exit the locker room and stand, be anywhere near when they're singing the national anthem because I can't believe in what's going on in our country right now. It's a good thing that those people that we remember on Memorial Day did not feel that way. What is honor these days? There are nearly 700 people buried in Arlington National Cemetery who died for what they believed in, who died for what we stand for. You can go, I was just talking to somebody who was at Gettysburg. Think about the battlefields that we have. Think about the cemeteries, the national cemeteries. <coughs> we should give thanks and honor the people who honored their beliefs. And what is it now? Do we honor our beliefs or we shy away from them? If we are not happy with the direction of the nation, what is the best thing to do? <coughs> Run and hide. Pretend it's not there. Complain about it. What does that say to the people that died for it? Whatever is honorable, Paul continues, whatever is just. I told you, which page, which word comes off the page so far? Truth, 
Honor, how about justice? We hear that word thrown around a lot lately, haven't we? The past two years, all we hear about is justice. This is a justice issue and we demand justice. What is just? Paul asked the question, whatever is just? And how do we get justice? By shouting in the streets? This is the same Paul that said these things to us. He said, when I was a child, I did what? Does anybody remember this passage? When I was a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. <coughs> when I became an adult, I did what? I put away my childish ways. Think about this. Consider this for a moment. How do we seek justice nowadays? We have a puppy. Our puppy is what, 16 weeks old? What does our puppy do when it doesn't get its own way? It cries, it bites. And we capitulate and give in, right? No, we tell it it's time to grow up. You teach it to grow up. When we have children, what does a child do when they don't get their own way? A little child, what do they do? They throw a tantrum. And when a child throws a tantrum, what do we do? I'm looking at my teachers. What do you do when a child throws a tantrum, Bobby? Let it throw a tantrum. There's nothing you can do. Grow up. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put away my childish ways. We see something in the world that is not just. What do we do? We throw a tantrum. We shout. We scream and yell. We have to take action. This isn't just. We're not sure what just is. Paul says to us, he points this out to us in the scriptures, whatever is noble, whatever is honorable, whatever is just. And then my favorite, he gets to hear, whatever is pure. Now so far we haven't figured out what some of these other virtues are, but purity we get, right? You know what pure is? Pure is the faith of a 10-year-old child. Would you agree? And we lost 19 of them this week. Whatever is pure. Whatever is lovely. Whatever is gracious. If, Paul says, there is anything worthy of praise... If there is any excellence. Does anybody here know what if means? The Bible I know. Webster not so much. If. If is a conjunction used to talk about the result or effect of something that may happen or may be true. Paul says if there is any excellence. He's talking about something that may happen or may be true. Is there any excellence? If there is anything worthy of praise, are you sure there is? The second definition comes this way. If is used to discuss an imaginary result or an effect of something that did not happen or is not even true. When Paul raises this question, he says, if there is any excellence, there may not even be that. He entertains the possibility that this could be an imaginary result. It is something that did not happen and may not even be true. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. All the things that we just talked about. Maybe there is no honor. Maybe there is no purity. Maybe. Maybe there's no truth. But I like the third definition here. If is used to say that something must happen before something else can happen. In other words, when you say if, what goes with if? If and then. If this happens, then that will happen. I found out in the earlier service, I had, and I bet I have somebody who knows this too. Do you all know who Kipling is, was? I know Bobby knows Kipling, right? Kipling 
in 1910, they published, that was 112 years ago, they published a poem called, If. I'll spare you the text in the interest of time, but what he did is, is Kipling wrote this poem, and it was a poem that he had written to his son. And he, he wrote to younger folks. And what he was saying in the poem is he was giving them a definition of what it was to be honorable, how to act. And what Kipling said was, is if you do this, and if you do that, and if you do this, and if you behave a certain way, and if you act a certain way, and you treat people a certain way, if you do these things, the last line is, then. And does anybody know how it ends? Betty Lee. You will be a man. Thank you, Ed. When I was a child, I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. And then I became an adult and I put away my childish ways. <coughs> if you behave a certain way, if you do these things, then this happens. And that's what Paul is telling us here in Philippians. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise. And then I love this word. think on these things. When I was in the fifth grade, I had a science teacher. Do you know what an impact somebody makes? I mean, if you can still remember your science teacher from fifth grade, and I'm looking at, like, you know I am, science is not my thing, right? <laughs> You're going to find out why in a minute. My science teacher was actually an Episcopal priest. And if you want to tell a very conservative Episcopal priest, I might have teaching earth science, okay, to elementary school kids. I don't remember a lot about what he taught, but I remember one thing he said. It has stuck with me all these years. He said to me, do you know the one thing that people do not do? He says, make sure whatever you take away from here years later, I want you to remember this. No one thinks anymore. People do not think they plan, they prepare, but they don't think. They receive information, they process, but do they think? He said the average person thinks less than three to five minutes a day. Consider that for a moment. I'm not talking about making out your shopping list or balancing your checkbook. You don't have to think. That's just stuff you do. How often do you Think. Just pure thinking. Paul said, think. But thinking is not simply an intellectual exercise. Processing the information that comes into us. The term that's used in this translation is meditate. Did you ever think of thinking as meditating? How many of you remember the story of Christmas? Everybody's got the Christmas story. Picture that in your mind. After the birth of Jesus, what happens? <clears throat> what do the shepherds do? Well, they come and they sing praises to God, right? They fall down on their knees and they worship. What do the angels do? Well, they're singing, and right? It's like the concert, looking for the encore, right? What do the wise men do? They bring gifts. What does Mary do? You know Mary, the mother of Jesus? The one who is highly favored? Who the Holy Spirit descends upon? Handpicked by God himself? What does Mary do? Do you remember? Gospel of Luke tells you. What did Mary do? Mary knows what's happening. Mary knows she has given birth to the incarnate Lord of all creation, and she also knows that a sword will pierce her side also. She knows that the cross is on the horizon for her infant child. What does Mary do in the midst of all this? Do you remember? What's the word they use? She pondered them in her heart. What does it mean to ponder? To think. But all of a sudden, thinking is no longer this intellectual exercise. Something that we do in a classroom or a laboratory. 
thinking is pondering. I'll give you a suggestion. You got thinking, pondering, and I'll give you a third word that goes with it. And you know what that is? Because they had mentioned it, treasured them in her heart. What was she really doing when she pondered that? She was pondering, she was thinking in her heart. What do we call that when we think in our heart? Some might think that's praying. Have you ever thought of thinking as praying? What did Jesus do in the Garden of Gethsemane? He prayed. When we think of praying, we tend to think of it as making a laundry list to the Lord. This is what I want. That's not what praying is. Jesus is thinking. Hear the prayer once again. Father, if this is possible, let this cup do what? Pass from me. He's thinking. He's reviewing his options. He's considering everything that's out there. He understands what God has in store for him, and he also knows what he's supposed to accomplish. He has the resources. He's piecing this all together. He is thinking. He is pondering. But how does the prayer end? Do you remember? Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Thinking, pondering, praying. You know, this past week when we see some of the tragedies going on in the world and we've had people screaming, enough is enough. And it's one thing when you see it coming at you from media outlets and you see it from activists. I have actually heard these words, not only there, but I have heard these words come from the church and leadership in the church. I'm tired of thoughts and prayers. We don't need your thoughts and prayers anymore. We need action. Something has to be done. Thoughts and prayers don't do any good anymore. I'm tired of hearing that. Now, you know, it's one thing when I hear that from the secular world. But when I hear that coming from the faith community, that breaks my heart. We don't need thoughts and prayers. We need actions. Because actions are what matter and actions are what count. Let's face it, we've taken a lot of actions. And they're not getting us very far, are they? But we think if we take one more action, we can resolve the issue. Perhaps, maybe, just maybe, it is time that we pray. Not with empty words, but pray fervently. When was the last time you prayed to the level of Jesus in the garden? <clears throat> Remember when Jesus is praying? What is, what is he doing? Is it a passive activity? What happened to Jesus praying in the garden? It tells us in the Bible. He's sweating. <coughs> Prayer is action. The epistle of James tells us that the prayers of the righteous are a powerful thing. The Bible tells us, how do you move a mountain? <coughs> With a bulldozer? With a crane? Those are actions. If you want to move a mountain, how do you do it? Life. Faith alone. Breaks my heart to hear. We don't need your thoughts and prayers. Oh, yes, we do. Now more than ever. Because praying is serious business. Because praying works. Paul tells us these things that you have learned and heard and received do. The God of peace will be with you. And then in case you miss it, Paul does this wonderful thing. Remember how I told you? Verse 8, I concluded with verse 9. He's still got more to come. He's got 14 more verses after that. And you know what we call the 14 verses that come after that? An encore. And what is Paul's encore? Paul says, I know this is tough. Patience is tough. I rejoice in the Lord greatly. 
Your care for me has flourished. I do not speak in regard to need. I have learned whatever state I am to be what? Content. I know how to be a base. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned to be full and to be hungry, to abound and to suffer. And then the encore. And you know what the encore is? Philippians 4.14. 4.13. And what does he say? Do all things. I can move them on. I can do all things. I can understand truth. I can understand honor. I can understand justice. There is purity. There is things that are lovely. There is gracious. There is excellence. I can do all of these things. Amen. If. That's the if. I can do it. What's the then? I can do all things through him who strengthens me. If I pray, if I ponder, if I think, if I follow these things that I've learned and reserved and heard in the name of Jesus Christ, then I can do all things through him who gives me strength. My brothers and sisters, we live in a world that is broken. I don't need to tell you that. Then again, we've always lived in a world that is broken. The message from Paul is clear. The message from the scripture is clear. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, <clears throat> think about these things. What you have learned and heard and received in me, do that. And the God of peace will be with you. Then all things, you can do all things through Christ who gives you strength. Amen. Could we stand, please?
finally, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is gracious, whatever is worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and heard and received do, and the God of peace will be with you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.